Okay, should we um, should we get started? I guess. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, my name is Jason Nordhaus. I'm a professor of physics at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, which is one of the colleges of RIT. And before I sort of start this presentation, I'm just going to give you some of my background. This is typically something if you, if you meet someone who's deaf or hard of hearing for the first time, this is usually one of the first conversations you'll have with them. Ask about them, their background, where they grew up, their family, that sort of thing. So, um, so I grew up uh, outside of Boston, uh, northwest, up near the New Hampshire border in a small town. Uh, I got interested in physics when I went to college for the first time, physics and mathematics, and um, I got my PhD from the University of Rochester, which is you know, only two miles away from RIT. After graduating there, uh, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University. And when I was at Princeton is really sort of when I became very interested in, in sign language, and I went to the Katzenbach School for the Deaf, which is the New Jersey School for the Deaf. It was in Trenton, so it was five minutes from Princeton, and um, I just started going there at night and taking classes, and um, after that, I was a National Science Foundation Astronomy and Astrophysics Fellow, which allowed me the opportunity to come to NTID and actually um, develop astronomy courses for them taught in sign language. And since then, uh, I'm an assistant professor of physics. I've been hired into the faculty, and I now uh, routinely teach physics and astrophysics courses in sign language for our students. Okay, so this, this presentation is going to be uh, generally about removing barriers for deaf participation in STEM fields. Um, and as a physicist, and principally I'm an astrophysicist, so that'll come up a bit, um, I'm a little bit focused on that, but I think generally the concepts I'm going to talk about uh, apply to sort of STEM fields in general. So before we actually get into some of the experiences I've learned and, and stuff about me, I thought we would just go through a... Uh, an exercise here. So if you could maybe turn to the partner, whoever's closest to you, I'm going to show you a video. And uh, for those of you that know sign language, this will be very simple. Um, for those of you that don't, though, I want you to try to be able to describe what you see with your hands. So there's no right answer here. Just give it a little whirl. See if you can sort of describe what's happening in the movie just using your hands. So let's start this. So don't be shy, go for it. You can. <laughs> yep, there we go. Okay, excellent. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so what? So let me pause the movie for a second here. Um, oops, let's go back here. So what are, the main, what are the main things here in this, right? So we know that there's a, there's a car. Uh, we know it's driving up this hill that's dirty. Maybe it's, you know, there's a lot of dirt. It's a red car. It's an SUV. It goes up, takes its time, it goes over the top. What I want to say is there's not really uh, any one way to do this, okay? So it, it sort of interpreting this or communicating information from this movie with your hands is an interpretation in some ways, right? There's some important things here you want to communicate to someone else. You want to get the gist of that, but then you can go into a lot of detail if you want. Now, let's try this again. Let's do it with a science topic. So here's a cell, and it's going to split in two. It's mitosis. So let's try this exercise again using your hands. Try to communicate what you see in this, in this movie. And there's a couple different examples of cells dividing here. Is that mitosis? Yes. yes. It's mitosis. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Okay, so here again, we've got a science concept now that you're trying to show and express with your hands. And there's different, you know, depending on what you want to, what you actually want to emphasize here. And in the next one, right after this, here you see the nucleus of the cell actually splits first, and then the cell itself splits into two. So you can get into different layered, layered nuances here when you communicate. Um, 
the one thing I would say about deaf and hard of hearing students is if they can see it, they can understand it. So the goal is to really paint pictures with your hands. But you need the pictures to be conceptually accurate. And I'm going to talk about that a lot today. But this is just a, a good icebreaker to warm everyone up. I would bring eggs into the classroom. OK, so, so she's saying she would bring eggs into the classroom and show it. <laughs> there you go. OK, um, this is a little fuzzy up here, I guess. Um, some deaf population statistics, these numbers are, there's actually large error bars on these numbers, so they're not exact. Um, this is typically data that's collected by the census or from various surveys the government does. But in the US, there's about something in the order of a million people who are functionally deaf. Now, functionally deaf means they have no hearing whatsoever. Primary mode of communication is, is sign of some sort. There's about three to nine million people that have a severe hearing impairment. Um, so you're talking something about maybe less than 30% hearing, typically in both ears. And then there's 30 to 43 million people who have some degree of hearing loss. And these typically tend to be uh, older folks. So as you age, your hearing starts to go. And again, these numbers have uh, you know, sort of broad error bars, but, but one million people is something like 0.3, 0.4% of the US population. A million people is a lot. Now, uh, I got interested in this in a while ago. So one of the things that really piqued my interest in, in sign language was, well, it's a little bit of an embarrassing story. I was um, in an airport. I think I was in Sydney or Auckland. I was somewhere, somewhere in, in that area. And, uh, and I was at an airport, and I saw two people signing. And I just sat there and watched them for an hour, which is horribly rude. And I did not know it at the time. Uh, but I was enthralled with it. And on that flight home, back to Princeton, I just started thinking about, like, do I know any, any deaf physicists? And I didn't, obviously. So when I got home, I tried to research it, see if I could find any, and I found very few. And then I got started thinking about other fields, like mathematics. And the question was really, well, OK, I, I don't know any, but let's see what the numbers actually say. So, so this chart here is for faculty level. Um, the top row shows you the total faculty in astronomy, physics, and mathematics in the US. Okay, so there's about 1,000 astronomy faculty, 9,000 physics, and there's a lot of mathematicians at the college level. So if you just sort of take the population statistics and project, if, we're, if sort of faculty were drawing from the average US population, what are the numbers here you'd, you'd predict for for functionally deaf faculty and for severe hearing loss faculty. And you know, you see in astronomy there should be about three to four, physics, something on the order of 30, and mathematics, uh, you know, even larger numbers. And if you're talking about then severe hearing uh, loss, then the numbers are even higher. And so there are very few. Uh, I know of a couple. Graduate students, you can sort of ask the same question, too. There's about uh, one graduate student for every faculty in astronomy on average, uh, in mathematics, and maybe a little bit more for physics. And you can just ask sort of what are the projected numbers of deaf graduates, uh, graduate students in astronomy, physics, and mathematics. And you get sort of largest numbers on the order of hundreds or few hundreds. Now, actually going and finding these people is, is very difficult. Uh, Great records are not kept. Mathematics is actually one of the, the areas that does do a really good job um, tracking their graduates and where they, where they go and what they end up doing. And so, uh, so since 1885, um, there's been something like 22 math PhDs awarded to, to deaf individuals. Ten of them were for fully functionally deaf, five are sort of a severe hearing impairment, and seven which sort of associate as hard of hearing. So in the last 20 years, seven of those have been awarded. So the current rate is about one every three years in the US in mathematics. But look at that predicted rate. There should be 60 to 150 per year. So this at least hints at some sort of barrier going on. Why, why are deaf individuals not sort of becoming graduate students? Why are they not becoming faculty? Um, what is going on here? In my own field, uh, astrophysics, we actually have some very, very well-known uh, deaf astronomers historically. 
I mean, these, these are people uh, that if you said their name to any astronomer, they would, they would know who these people are. Um, so this is true up to about the turn of the century um, and a little bit later, and then sort of there's, there's been not really any examples uh, since then. John Goodricke, uh, he's the youngest Copley Medal winner. He was born deaf. Annie Jump Cannon and Henrietta Leavitt both lost their hearing uh, through illness. But these people are extremely famous. Uh, Annie Jump Cannon has a, a yearly award named after her. Uh, again, these are people that if you said their name, if you mentioned their name to someone, uh, to any astronomer, they'll know who they are. So we have some at least uh, historical examples of deaf astronomers. But there's really a lot of barriers, um, current barriers to access. The biggest, I think, is, is communication. There's just, there are just still communication barriers. Um, there's limited technical signs. So, so astrophysics, physics, mathematics, STEM fields tend to be highly technical. Uh, a lot of times there's not well-developed vocabulary. There's no deaf faculty. There's very few deaf faculty. So there's no role models um, in some cases. Interpreters in the classroom, so if you're a deaf student, let's say at Ohio State, and you're taking a physics class, um, the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, requires that Ohio State accommodate you in the classroom. And so they could put in things like a captionist or an interpreter uh, to help the students. And, uh, and RIT trains the most interpreters uh, in the U.S. So we graduate the most interpreters. They go out all over the country. They do extremely excellent work. Interpreting is very, very difficult. Like, I am in awe of interpreters. Their brains have to listen to me talk while they sign. It's very, very difficult. Um, it requires expert knowledge in both languages and areas of the brain working together. So interpreters spend a lot of time training to, to gather these uh, skills. But science, technology, engineering, mathematics also requires a large amount of time and training to develop skills. And so interpreters typically don't have STEM backgrounds. So that's sort of an issue, um, too. And to give you an example of that, uh, I've, I've supervised lots of students on deaf research projects. And they've presented at conferences like the American Astronomical Society and other things. And um, just to give you an example here, one of my students was working on a, what's called the three-body problem. And in astrophysics, that's very well known. It's, it's like three stars moving around each other, let's say. And uh, during this presentation the student was giving, uh, I was sort of watching with how the interpreters up there were interpreting for other deaf students in the room. And they were assigning three people have a problem or an issue. So right there, conceptual accuracy is gone. I mean, if I saw that, I would be very confused as to what that means. <laughs> now, there's other benign cases, too. Um, so maybe most of you know it, but the first detection of gravitational waves from binary black hole mergers. Uh, RIT had a huge press announcement on it because our gravity group is very famous, and we provided the waveforms that match, that LIGO matched on for the binary black hole mergers. So we had a press conference immediately after uh, the National Science Foundation's press conference, and I. I met with the interpreters like literally five minutes before this happened and um, said, okay, how are you guys going to sign binary black hole merger? And so the interpreter shows sort of black hole and they use this hand here. That hand basically means something very flat, like a circular flat disk. Black holes are not flat disks, they're actual spheres. And so we talked about what's a, what's a good way to conceptually sign that um, with two sort of two balls moving around each other and then merging into one. And then the gravitational waves coming off that. So we discussed it extensively before they interpreted it, and it was perfect. They did it great. I mean, it was on television, like all of Rochester. It was fantastic. So even when sort of uh, some of these things are, are pretty good, uh, conceptual accuracy is something that, that I spend a lot of my time thinking about. What is the best way to conceptually visualize this so that the science is accurate? Because physics and mathematics are very precise and accurate um, uh, languages, essentially. OK, so just just give you, um, for some of you that don't know about American Sign Language, uh, just some basic stuff. It's one of about 300 manual languages in the world. Um, so just like 
and he spoke in language, there's a diversity here, by countries, by regions, localities. It's generally thought in the US, uh, ASL specifically, it's generally thought to have originated at the American School for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, it borrows elements of French Sign Language and British Sign Language. But this is a very important result here back in 1960. This is a National Science Foundation study um, where ASL was established as a formal language. It has unique syntax and grammar. So one example of that is in English, uh, you would sort of, uh, you would put adjectives followed by nouns. So you'd say like the blue book. But in ASL, it's reversed. You start sort of with the noun and you layer onto that noun. That's just one example. Other sort of unique uh, parts of it is if you're talking about time, if you're discussing time, you always start with time first. So there's a formal language, unique syntax, formal grammar that you actually have to match to. So um, in 1990, comes along the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, it's authored by Senator Harkin of Iowa, signed into the law by President Bush. Basically pro prohibits discrimination, um, similar to the Civil Rights Act. And it requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations. And so that, again, is why if you have a deaf student in your classroom, the university is then required reasonably to provide an interpreter. Um, when my very first student went to the American Astronomical Society's meeting, um, we worked with their leadership to provide interpreters for that meeting. Uh, I think it was the first time they'd done that. So uh, it, was, it was an interesting educational experience for them, and it was fantastic. It got tons of people were interested in it. I mean, it was very visible during the conference. So accessibility is something that, that we're working hard on and organizations are required by law to work on. Okay, so let's say you are a, um, you're a deaf high school student and you're thinking you want to go to college. Uh, two things that would instantly come to mind are NTID, which is, again, part of a Rochester Institute of Technology. And we are in upstate New York, Rochester, New York. The other big one is Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. There are other ones. Uh, Cal State University Northridge is another example. And there are others that have small pockets of deaf students. But these are, are sort of the two that would instantly come to mind. There are different institutions. So at RIT, we accommodate communication preferences. So it's up to the student. So um, if it's a one-on-one -on -one student and I'm having a meeting with them and they, they are pure ASL, that's what I use. If it's a student who uh, is more oral uh, or cues off my speech, it's a simultaneous communication where I'm signing and I'm speaking at the same time. RIT has degree options ranging from the associate's level to the bachelor level to the master's level to the PhD level in many, many, many fields. Um, in physics and uh, astronomy, we have a PhD. So there's a pipeline there to go all the way up to graduation where then you've got your doctorate and then maybe you can go and do a postdoc or become a faculty member somewhere else. Gallaudet University is ASL only. Um, they don't have any physics or astronomy degree options. They have, I think, one course that supports like chemistry and biology majors, uh, but they don't have any physics and astronomy. They are more of a liberal arts college we are uh, we are a research university. I have a question. Yes. If I may. Um, so I graduated from Gallaudet University, and it is a liberal arts university. So they did offer physics courses back then. Yep. There were just a few students, and that I believe is why. So I want the audience to be aware that they don't offer. Yeah, you're right. So they did used to, and I've actually. I've talked to, communicated with the, uh, the physics faculty member there who, who used to offer those. And um, he's actually, I think, retiring next year. But, uh, but they, did, they did stop offering those, I think, I think maybe a couple decades ago. So yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, OK, so NTID. Uh, actually, NTID was uh, established by an act of Congress, which makes it a little bit interesting. I mean, uh, Gallaudet also, but. But uh, NTAD was established by Congress in 1965. We have about 1,400 deaf and hard of hearing students on campus, which is about 8% of our student body. 
And I tell people this all the time, RIT is, is the most um, diverse campus I've ever seen in my life. Um, I've been on a lot of campuses in the US, I've been on a lot of international campuses. I don't think many come close to the diversity we have. Um, you see sort of deaf students communicating with hearing students. You know, they get there on campus, they make a friend, they learn sign language. It's really phenomenal. It's the largest technical school for deaf students in the world. And when it was established by Congress, the, the point of it was to, um, to help these students get into the workforce so that they wouldn't end up on sort of social security benefits or something like that. And so uh, historically, we've hovered around 95, 96% of our students are employed within one year of graduation. We do a tremendous job of getting them jobs. Uh, we have a historic co-op program, um, but the goal is to get our students jobs. Whatever those jobs may be. Question. Real quick. Yeah. Quick question. So I've seen that statistic many times. The high percentage of the first year that you just shared after yep. graduating. I'm curious. Can you share a statistic uh, in five or ten years, fifteen years of folks who've retained employment? Can you share that information? Yeah, that, uh, that's a good. I don't know the answer to that. I do know the person that compiles this. So one of the one of the nice things is, or unique things for us is, we're allowed by the Social Security Administration to actually track our students throughout their lives. So we have that data. I know who to ask to to figure out what those numbers are, but I don't know what they are off the top of my head. So um, I'll grab your email later, and I can I can find those numbers for you. Thank you. Okay, so some unique possibilities at RIT um, are, and this is now a little bit more in my interest here. We have an astrophysics graduate program. I am a program faculty member in it. We've got 16 astrophysics faculty members. We have out a PhD and master's program. Um, we have fantastic access services on campus. You know, anything the students need, we have it there. The, but the goal for me and the goal for a lot of the, my other colleagues is to sort of build a pathway for deaf and hard of hearing students to, to <coughs> sort of get these terminal degrees, go to graduate school, don't stop, or actually even bachelor's degrees, right? Um, actually get out there, get to these classes. If you're interested in physics, we shouldn't have any barrier that would prevent you from doing it. So that's sort of my goal um, and, and the goal of many of my colleagues. Teaching at NTID has been like an amazing experience. Um, you know, the first time I had to teach in a classroom, uh, it's a little bit like you just you're thrown in the water. I mean, the, you don't really understand it until you experience it, until you sort of you you meet all these students, you figure out what all their needs are. I mean, there are some best practices that beforehand, you know, these are the things you should be doing. But then once you're in there doing them, it's it's very interesting. So. So the first thing is in any given classroom that I would teach, any given class I teach, uh, we have very diverse students both in their backgrounds and their communication. So, uh, so they, they can be, you know, growing up they can be isolate, isolated, they're coming from, you know, remote areas of the country, um, they could be coming from more mainstream environments, um, they could sign an ASL, they could, they could basically do signed English, they could not sign at all. They, I mean, you see everything coming out of them. When they graduate, they have to do two things. They have to be able to read and write English, and they have to be able to sign. And you would, uh, maybe you wouldn't be shocked, but we get students who don't know how to sign, and we also get students who sign but don't know how to read and write English. So uh, we have intensive courses set up to help these students so that by the time graduation comes, they can read and write English and they can sign. Deaf students are extremely visual. Uh, if you can show them something, they can understand it. Formal lecture styles when, when you're, you're teaching in these classrooms is very different. Classroom management is very different. Um, and then teaching assignments for me as a, a faculty member there, as assistant professor, typically come in two forms. It could be formal teaching of a course, so like mechanics, you know, physics one. That's what I'll be teaching in the fall. Um, traditional classroom teaching assignments is one thing, but another teaching assignment I can get that, that would also count towards my teaching hours are tutoring sessions. And so here we've got students that are sort of in these bachelor degree programs in mathematics, physics, astronomy, or graduate programs in any of these fields. And what ends up happening is a content expert at NTID will be assigned as the faculty tutor for the student. 
and has to help bridge those communication gaps um, that may occur. So, for instance, I you know you have a student who's taking quantum mechanics, and they're talking about quantum entanglement, and that's a complicated thing that requires some knowledge. And so, interpreters are doing like their best, their heroic tasks, but sometimes those things get lost in translation. And so my job as someone who knows about physics is to bridge those gaps so they have clear conceptual understanding of what's going on. So is there a way that you've been able to um, or a free resource or any resource for maybe like a high school science teacher that could maybe use those skills? Yeah, uh, let's, I'm going to show a little bit of that. Yeah, there, is some, there are some resources that you can tap into. I will mention a few of them. We can discuss okay. afterwards, too. I can tell you some more. But examples. So the first time I went in the classroom, uh, let's say I wanted to show this. I would talk over it like I am now. But in the deaf classroom, I need to stop and watch you guys while you read it. So let's go ahead and read this. So it's my job to actually watch you, and I watch your eyes, and I know when they're done. So another important thing in the classroom is where the students are situated. <laughs> this is actually not so bad. I have clear line of sight to most of you. Can you also say it out loud in case anybody can? Yep. Thank you, yeah. So this quote is, the earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our last stand. And this is a quote by Carl Sagan. So in my classes that I teach, classroom seating is very important. I have to have clear line of sight to all the students. And they also have to have clear line of sight to each other. So you can sign. So we tend to arrange seating in a semicircle, and this is actually not so bad here, but if someone in the back of the room wanted to communicate, they'd have to stand up, everyone would look over there, clearly, and then they could sign whatever, and then sit back down. So classroom seating is quite important. Instructor position was something I hadn't thought of before I got in the classroom. It depends on your dominant hand uh, and where, what technology is being used. So I actually, for a while, it was it was a little awkward until you figure out you know, how to position yourself uh, during one of your courses. And this I never would have expected. I had a student thank me once for, for shaving um, because they can actually see my face. They can see the expressions. I didn't tell the student that like, even if I tried to grow a beard, I'm not actually able to. It would just look <laughs> horrible. So, but, uh, but that was like a, a different experience that I hadn't anticipated too. So, um, like I said, when I got to NTIT, the first thing I did was I developed an astronomy course for them because they didn't have one. Um, we, had, we had astronomy courses at RIT where you could go in and you could have interpreters, but we didn't have any astronomy course at NTIT where it would be taught by someone who could sign and knows the content. <coughs> so I established that. Uh, we offered it in the fall of 2013, and I've taught it, I guess, like five times since then. It's offered every fall. This tends to be one of the most popular courses at NTID. Um, I usually always have a long wait list. The course goal is to explore the cosmos, learn modern scientific methods and techniques astronomers employ to study the universe and humanity's place in it. So it's a survey course. It's an introduction to astronomy. This is my first, my first group of students. Um, we went to a field trip to the Eastman Museum. Uh, George Eastman is the founder of Eastman Kodak. And it's his mansion, but there's this uh, film and, and photograph. And they did a history of space photography. This course is so fun to teach. <laughs> Students are great. Um, it's, it's just amazing. That course I've actually been using as a test bed for the last three or four years. Um, so here, uh, standing next to me, is Dr. Jessica Trussell. She's an assistant professor in our master's in science and secondary uh, education program at NTID. So she's a, she does research in educational outcomes. And so what we've been doing is the last few years, we've been running intervention studies of various kinds in my astronomy course to try to see what works and what doesn't. And it's too bad. 
Well, we can see it a little bit. Lighting in here is not great, but um, but anyway, I can tell you at least about one of these at the moment. Um, one that actually was quite successful that that we've been I've been using my courses since then. And the goal of this particular uh, study was to teach what's called morphological knowledge. So. You know, when you grow up and you're reading English, you build sort of some sort of knowledge about a word into it. So when you encounter a new word in science, let's say, you tend to break it down into the components you know so you can sort of infer what the meaning of the word is. Now our students are typically delayed in this morphological knowledge. Um, so we decided we'd try to run an intervention study in the classroom to teach it during the course. And so here's an example, the word constellation. If you break it into its component parts, the con means with or together, stella refers to stars, and the t-i-o-n is the state or condition of it. So it's a group of stars together, essentially. And that's what a constellation is. It's a grouping of stars on the, on the sky. So this actually was extremely successful. Um, <coughs> what you typically do in these uh, types of studies is you measure a baseline knowledge. You teach specific knowledge for some time until they get mastery of that. And then you wait some period of time and you come back and you uh, measure it to see if that knowledge sticks. Right? So if you teach mastery but it's gone after a week and they're back to their baseline, that's not a great outcome. Uh, what ended up happening with all these students is they, they got up to their uh, mastery of the, of the content and then they maintained it. And so it was fantastic. What was also interesting about this is we had two students in this class who were trilingual. Everyone else was bilingual. The two that were trilingual actually took much longer to get to mastery, which was a little bit interesting. Small number of statistics, but, um, but quite, quite interesting. So the idea is that if you teach sort of the, the root suffixes in the Greek and Latin, then these students go into other science courses, and they've got at least a chance of understanding what a word is from, from it, just seeing it written down. Uh, I'm going to talk a couple more uh, initiatives that are going on. Um, the first is that I just got a big award from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, and I don't know, maybe not everyone knows who Gordon Moore is, but he's the founder of Intel Corporation. Um, you've also may have heard of Moore's Law, which has to do with transistors on computer chips doubling every two years about. But they, um, they sort of foster breakthrough scientific discovery, environmental conservation, patient care improvements and preservation of the Bay Area. Um, but I, uh, we had a program officer come to RIT. I met with him. They do special projects that can be championed that are outside of this. And uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, I gave him sort of a white paper, a one-page description of what I wanted to do. Never thought I'd, I, he would contact me again. Um, it turns out his da daughter is actually hard of hearing. He didn't mention this to me when we were there. Um, he looked at this project, took it on, and, and got it through the foundation, and, um, and we just started work on this. So the idea is to create sort of conceptually accurate signed physics videos that we're going to test in uh, RIT mainstream classrooms. So we're taking sort of the content from mechanics and electricity and magnetism, and we are developing sort of around each concept <coughs> about a three to five minute video that's explaining that concept very clearly in sign language. Mm -hmm. Now that is then can be used uh, by the interpreters beforehand. It can be used by the students beforehand. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to measure uh, how learning outcomes happen in those situations, where the interpreters use it only, where the students use it only, and then when the interpreters and the students use it together beforehand. And just putting on the web right now? This is not. This project actually just started. So, about yeah, <laughs> check back with me in about nine right. to twelve months. Okay. Um, we are though. Uh, so in year three of this award, we are going to test this in external universities. So there's two. So we have a list of twelve right now. So if you are at a university, a faculty at a university, and you have some death physics students, you're a potential partner for us uh, in a couple of years. <coughs> sure. So. Are you looking at any um, curriculum that is out there that exists? And I see this is college level, so have you 
Yeah, so more uh, specifically, more foundation uh, doesn't do anything at the K through 12 <coughs> level. I think actually this would be useful for high school students taking, especially like an intro physics course. Um, so the nice thing is once we have this material out there, it could be used for that purpose. But in terms of testing out, we, we're bound to stay at the collegiate level. Okay, yeah. and would it be a free resource? Yes, Great. it's going to be disseminated and uh, freely available. Another area, um, some initiatives that have started up uh, three years ago now is uh, these NSF projects for there's a research experience for undergraduates. So this is a program the NSF funds. They happen at different universities all across the country. They're sort of summer research experiences. So if you're an undergraduate and you're you know, a sophomore or junior, you apply to these programs, then you go to whatever university you're at and you work on a project for 10 weeks. We have two of them um, that I'm part of. The bottom one there is in multi-messenger astrophysics. That program has a requirement that we have at least two deaf students in the program. And so we're in the third year for that now, and I think we've had a total of eight deaf students uh, over the years for it. It's up for renewal, so we're hoping that gets renewed this year. The other one started last summer, and the PI of this is uh, it's an undergraduate research for students who are deaf or hard of hearing and applying mathematical and statistical methods to problems in the sciences. That's a, a mouthful. Um, that is a fully deaf REU program. It's the only one in the country. So uh, you have to be deaf or hard of hearing to apply to it. We're in year two of that. Our first year was excellent. We had this fantastic cohort of 11 students. This year we have 12 students. Um, and, and the way we pitch that is that these are applying mathematical methods to the sciences. Because any individual, like physics, chemistry, biology, you may not have enough deaf students to have an actual REU program. So we pulled them all together, and they have a cohort experience with other deaf students who are researching problems in the sciences. Any other countries offer this? That's a good question. Uh, so I don't know other countries. I mean, not the NSF. These sorts of things are only for the U.S., but there may, other countries may have programs similar to this. I'm not sure. So here, uh, just show you guys um, students. These are the, all the students I've worked with that are deaf on projects. And um, as you can see, there's a wide range of these. Most of these, not all, maybe like a half of them have come through the REU programs. Right now, I've got two students working with me. Emily Flynn, she's a, um, a deaf physics major at the University of Virginia. And Sam is at Gallaudet University. And so they're, they're at RIT for the summer working on through the REU program. I've, uh, at the top here is Brianna Harold. She's, uh, she's she did her master's thesis with me. She'll be defending it in a month. Um, she's going to go to the University of Minnesota to start a PhD in uh, bioinformatics. Um, and the other ones, so anyone here that has name is underlined, they're starting their graduate programs in the fall. So Amy will be at uh, RIT. David Speaker is going into the optics PhD program at the University of Rochester. And Brianna is going to the University of Minnesota. So. And just, I'll mention just two slides left, oh, and you can't see this. We also did a really fun project that was funded through the NSF, which was called AstroDance. This was to um, make a multimedia sort of dance visualization thing that told the story of the hunt for gravitational waves. This was funded, we went on tour, I think, a year before the discovery. Um, and so this was, it was signed, it was, these are our, our NTID dance students doing it. It was about an hour-long presentation. It toured the, uh, the east coast of the US. So that was a really fun project to be involved with. And just if you have a, I'll just end on this note, um, some things to think about. If you have a deaf student in your class, these are just some basic things you can do to, to help and make the situation a little bit more uh, better. Work with the interpreters ahead of time. Help them with the knowledge. They'll be able to figure out the best way to sign things, but they need to sort of have some understanding of the concept. Manage the classroom discussions, one person speaking at a time, wait, finish, then the next person. Personal questions are cultural. This was uh, not a shock, but this is, I have been asked some questions that I'm um, like, okay, it's, it's a cultural thing. Also, touching is a lot more prevalent and, you know, Deaf culture is very, very rich. It's very rich. So um, these are just some things that are, that are unique to there that maybe aren't to hearing culture. 
be flexible, ask what works and what doesn't work. The students will, will let you know. I mean, that's really the key. You're there for them. Help them however they need help. And then make the material as visual as possible. Again, if they can see it, they can understand it. Your question? Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the, uh, someone that's part of hearing this completely applies to that as well, so they don't have to be deaf. Yep, they exactly. Yeah, and when I, when I say deaf here, I, I'm, I'm talking more about anyone with, you know, associates as deaf or hard of hearing. Yep. So I think I'll end on that note. I, I don't know if I went over time or what time it is, but I'll, uh, I'll end there and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that anyone has. So questions? Yes. Yep. Because right now we're having a problem that the conference is too big to hire an interpreter and um, help closed captioning for every single place. But at the same time, we're also coming across a problem where we don't want deaf part of hearing or blind low vision to feel tied to the interpreter and like I have to drag my entourage with me. Yep. So um, what, and so a lot of people feel chained and so how do you suggest, do you know any apps or anything that can help with it, or is there I mean, I, I know exactly what you're discussing, because um, I've encountered it with my students that go to like the AAS conferences, for instance. Um, I, sort of the best thing, it, it, it's tough because, because you, you, as a student, you're going to a conference, or even as a conference participant in general, you go to the conference, you pick out some things you're interested in, but things are fluid, right? So maybe during the conference, you change your mind, you want to go somewhere else, or or, or see a different talk. Um, and then, you, what you typically do is you schedule interpreters for certain blocks. So if the conference schedule is posted well in advance, and and whoever's going can review it, then you can sort of at least make a rough guide. Um, there's no real easy answer for this. I think I, I, I think it has a lot to do with sample, you know, sort of survey who's going to go to the conference that needs the accommodations. They can make the best guesses they are. And then if possible, if money is no option, have some float resources where if something does become fluid and someone wants to go somewhere else, they can latch onto those float resources and go. But it's, it's expensive. It's very expensive. So it's that reasonable part of the ADA accommodations. You know, what does the organization feel is reasonable? And um, there's just no easy solution for it. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I want to make a comment towards that. I, I'm totally in the same boat, so I have uh, a caption is right over here for me, and that's what I'm dealing with with this conference as well. So I definitely don't think it's just a large conference problem. I think it's an all-conference problem. Um, one of the things, though, that I did at my last conference is there's an app out from Google now called well, Live I Transcribe. I was using it during your presentation. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> So it's a really great program. It basically uses the microphone on your phone mm -hmm. and in real time gives you captioning for what's being said. So I recommend pulling that out, downloading it on your phone and using it literally everywhere anybody's talking. What is it called again? Live transcribe. Okay. It's not for Apple. Uh, yeah, it only works on Android. Um, and then also I recommend asking the conference coordinator to block off the first three or four seats up front in front of any room and don't be afraid or shy to just push your way up to the front there and that way you'll be able to be a little bit closer and also if you're using live transcribe or other things, Apple does have their own apps as well that do a similar thing and that way you can hold it up and be closer to the microphone. The final thing that I do recommend is I use an FM system, and my FM system is a very simple three and a half millimeter aux cable. So it's very cheap. Every conference should be able to put that in every room at least, and then you can hook into the sound system through there. For Apple, you can use Live Transcriber. I'm not um, well diverse in how well it is, but I've heard good things about it. I know um, we've done some of um, <coughs> the Skype has a new transcription, and we found uh, with the chemistry stuff, it's pretty good at 
figuring out words that are very similar. <laughs> Thank you. I did have a question for your research on online. Was there, I know this is the beginning of the grant, but I didn't catch where I could see where it was posted. Or yeah, so I would say we don't know yet. So okay. I, there are some other resources at NTID that have sort of um, like videos for science stuff where they just show a sign. So they'll just show like, you know, uh, hydrogen. This is the sign you use, sort of. So we have that <coughs> stuff I can point you to. But we don't, I don't know where we're going to host this yet. It'll be something at NTID, but I don't, I don't know at the moment. Thank you. Welcome. Um, by the way, see me afterwards. Okay. Any other questions? So I know that your focus is physics and astronomy. Mm -hmm. I'm a biomedical engineer. Do you know of any of this type of work that's happening in the science um, fields that are not in physics or astronomy? Yeah, uh, so again, some of these resources I'm mentioning over here uh, are focused on like biology, biochemistry, some of this other stuff. So I can point you to some of that. Uh, in terms of, I mean, we have things like um, Bridges programs for students to go into uh, PhD programs in, in bio-related fields. Uh, that's funded through the NIH. Um, but in terms of, if you're talking about specifically these short concept conceptual videos, I don't know of anything going on like at the moment. Part of the thing with more is that if we test this out and it works for physics and astronomy, we can show <coughs> actual data from the classrooms, not only at RIT, but other universities. If it's successful, then there's nothing to stop it from happening in the other fields, because um, I think it would be a similar idea. So, so there may be more funding and more grants we can get to expand this into, into other technical fields. But sort of focus on physics and astronomy, because that's where my content knowledge is. And, um, and that's sort of a test bed where we can show it works there, that we can do it other places. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks.